clapping. So welcome everyone, uh, happy new year. I'm very excited to have Rupert Frank here to speak today and he will talk about minimal magnetic field supporting a zero mode. Please go ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction to speak here, uh, the invitation and uh, the introduction and happy new year to you too. And I'm going to talk about a certain problem which is motivated by physics, but which I really think is more a geometric problem, perhaps even has some topological aspects. And to be honest, we don't quite understand it yet. But I think it, it would be very nice if some more people would be aware of this problem and contribute ideas. So um, having said that, please interrupt me if, if you have questions or want to have some explanations more. I start by explaining a little bit of the physics background, uh, but uh, that's not really needed for the remainder. And actually, I start uh, with the main theorem just to give you a little bit of a preview of what it's all about. And then comes the physics introduction. And all I'm going to say is joint work with Michael Loss from Georgia Tech. So here's this theorem. Um, that we're talking about. So we have a certain equation. Okay, it's a first order equation, which is set, and it's a linear equation in Psi. And this equation is set in all of R3. All right. Now, we're assuming we have a non-trivial solution to that equation. And moreover, that this solution goes to um, zero at infinity in some LP sense. P here can be any number between three halves or infinity. That's not particularly important. Or rather, you will see the importance uh, later on. And so there is a coefficient in this equation. That's A, that's a vector field. And the point is, if we have a non-trivial solution, then this coefficient needs to be large. And how do we measure this? Well, we measure it in terms of its curl, or more precisely, in terms of the three halves norm of its curl. And so the statement is, if we have a non-trivial solution to such an equation, then the three half norm of its curl needs to be larger than twice S3. And what is S3? Well, that's the optimal constant in the Sobolev inequality in R3. I'm sorry, Rupert, what is the sigma? Maybe you said that. Okay, so I'm talking, um, I'll explain that in the, on the next slide. So this is the vector of Pauli matrices. So what we have here, actually, that's a Dirac operator. Okay, and it will be um, explained on, on the next slide for, for now, just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a first order equation um, and we're asking about existence of trivial or non-trivial solutions. And what we're interested in here is conditions on the, I mean, you can turn it around the other way if this coefficient is small then you don't have a non-trivial solution, right? And so we're interested in this existence, non-existence threshold, and more precisely in this value of the constant, the 2s3. And if you are happy with a bound with 1 times s3, well, that's relatively easy to do. Also, we have explicit examples that say that 4 times s3 is the largest possible value here. So some the true constant is somewhere between two and four times S3. And sort of the goal of the talk would be, I mean, or the, the problem would be to, to find the, the optimal value of the constant here. And I try to tell you how to get from the simple bound S3 to the bound 2S3. Okay, and now why is this somehow, where's the difficulty? That's now where the sigmas come in. That's the fact that these objects that appear in the equation are non-scalar quantities. Okay, so I already said that A is a vector field. Okay, and then the psi is a spinner field, which is means simply that it takes values in C2. Okay, and so you take the gradient, I mean, each partial derivative 
gives you still a, a C2 valid function. And then sigma, these are three two by two matrices whose precise form I will recall. And so, so in that sense, the, the equation uh, is to be understood. Okay, and so from a wider perspective, what we're really interested in is sharp functional inequality for non-scalar objects. And I think it's fair to say that we hardly know anything about such inequalities. You know, we know a lot about Sobolev inequalities for functions. But as soon as you go to vector fields or spinner fields or uh, forms, P forms, um, then our knowledge is very, very limited, which of course has to do with these things that one usually uses in order to prove such sharp inequalities, like for instance, symmetric decreasing rearrangement, or also what people have done is mass transport or things like that. Those all become not available, or at least nobody knows how to use them for these non-scalar problems. And so really from a wider perspective, we're interested in such um, functional inequalities for non-scalar objects. And what makes this equation particularly um, nice is that it has a lot of structure. And in particular, the problem is conformally invariant. Okay, so you can equally pose it on S3. And the point is that often, if you have these symmetries, that should help you in determining optimal constants. Even though, as I said, I mean, we have the constant two there and we don't know, we don't claim that two is the sharp constant. One might wonder whether actually four is the sharp constant. Okay, but that was just a little bit of a preview of what is going to happen in this talk. So let me backtrack now a little bit and tell you a little bit where, where all this stuff comes from. Okay, so there's something in mathematical physics, which is called the Pauli operator. All right, and that's exactly, so here I've written out these three two by two matrices, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. And then there is this way of multiplying, I mean, this vector of matrices by uh, a vector now three, that's uh, namely just taking the, the first entry of the vector times the first matrix plus uh, with the second and the third. Okay, and so when you do this in a formal sense of an operator, here you get this uh, Dirac-like operator. And then what people in mathematical physics like to do, they like to take the square of this operator. And this is called the Pauli operator. And physically this describes the interaction of a particle spin with an external magnetic field. And you can also work this out and then you see this is the ordinary magnetic Laplacian, which somehow acts trivially in spin space. And then you have an additional term, which now couples the spin. Okay, now everybody in his or her physics course has learned uh, about the, the hydrogen atom. Okay, and then surprisingly, rather late in 1986, Fröhlich, Lieb and Loss asked the question, what happens with a hydrogen atom when you place it in a, in a magnetic field? And they came up with a certain condition, which they probably thought was just a technical condition. It was that a certain equation does not have a solution. Okay, and only under such a condition could they prove stability of hydrogen, which is really, uh, would be a basic property. And then it was, I mean, it's published in the same year, Loss and Yao, this is H.T. Yao, um, discovered actually that this condition that appeared as a rather technical uh, condition in the work of Fröhlich, Lieb and Loss actually did have non-trivial solutions. So more precisely, they found solutions of exactly that equation that we had on the previous slides. Those are called zero modes. And since then, there has been a lot of work in the physics and also in the mathematical physics literature trying to understand these pairs. And kind of the, the, the main idea is that in two dimensions, there's something called the Aronoff Kescher theorem, which classifies all the solutions to this equation. I think that corresponds um, essentially to some index theorem. 
or something. That works in two dimensions. But in three dimensions, it's unknown, where, I mean, whether one can classify this. And as I said, I don't want to insist too much on the physics thing. And you see already one uh, difference here. I mean, in physics, the natural quantities are the two norms, the two norms of the curl and the two norm of psi. However, what will be important for our talk is actually different quantities, namely the three halves norm of the curl and the three norm of the function. Those are geometrically the most important quantities. So that being said, um, doing what we do also helps to um, improve some of the knowledge in the physical problem, but I will not talk about this today. Okay, so after this introduction, the question is, what is the minimum value of the three halves norm of the curl of A among all A such that there's a non-trivial solution to this? Does that make sense? Okay, and as I already said, Loss and Yao found such non-trivial solutions and they, if you look at those, you find that this three halves norm is exactly four times the Sobolev constant. And the question you can make this question, I mean, a little bit more concrete by asking, are actually the loss Yao zero modes the minimal zero modes? And I've put them up here, so just that you see them sort of um, directly, this will not be important. Here are the zero modes. This is the, the construction of loss and Yao. They have here um, the Psi function, the Psi spinner and the, the vector field A. And while well, you can check that they solve the equation, you can also compute the curl of A and I mean, one thing that's already interesting is about this is that the field lines for this, both for A and for, for B, they're actually uh, circles. And the circles are linked, uh, the different circles are linked together. And it's exactly the, the circles that you get from the hop vibration when you pull it back, I mean, via the stereographic projection, okay? so. This already indicates sort of that there's a lot of uh, geometric or topological structure in the problem. But as I said, I mean, it's not known whether these are the optimals and we are sort of still far away from, from understanding this. So why did I say that this problem is actually the vector analog or the non-scalar analog of something that is understood. Let me try to explain that. And while explaining this, I also try to explain the proof strategy that will be important later for us. So the scalar problem is, look at this equation. Okay, minus Laplacian u plus vu is equal to zero. And imagine you have a non-trivial solution which again for definiteness, I mean, which should be small infinity and for definiteness, let's assume it's in L6. And the, you could ask the question, what is the minimal three halves norm of this coefficient V that appears in the equation? And so I'm claiming that's exactly the Sobolev constant and that this is not particularly hard. So let's look at this argument, okay? So, I'm talking about the middle equality here. The equality comes simply from multiplying the equation by u and integrating by parts, right? So then you get a gradient here, the two norm of the gradient squared on the left. On the right, you get v times u squared. Now on the right side, I mean, since you wanna get to the three halves norm of v, what you can do is you apply Hölder's inequality. That's what happens here. And then you end up with the square of the six norm. On the other hand, when you look at the, the gradient squared, of course, you can bound that from below by Sobolev's inequality. And again, you find the sixth norm. 
And so you have uh, six norm squared on both sides of the equation. So as soon as u is non-trivial, you just can cancel it and you'll find that the three halves norm of v is actually greater or equal than S3. And it's not very, um, very difficult to see that actually you can achieve equality in both inequalities. Okay, so the, the analytic ingredient here in this problem is really Sobolev's inequality. In that way, we want to think of the existence, non-existence equation for that, uh, the existence, non-existence question for this equation as sort of an equation analog of Sobolev's inequality. So therefore, you might want to ask, what is sort of the Sobolev type inequality behind that equation? And I will talk about that, but only later, because this is something that we really don't quite understand. And, but what I think is very interesting. In any case, since we don't have such an analog, the vector or spinner case is much harder, but please keep this um, in mind. The other point that I want to mention is, you know, when you have these problems, of finding something optimal, it's often very important to understand the symmetries. Okay. And I already mentioned the conformal invariance of the problem. Um, let me say it once again. So if you have a conformal map from R3 to itself, really, you, I mean, you think of it as a conformal map of S3, then you can modify, well, A, just in the way you would modify a vector field. And then there's also a way of modifying the spin of psi, which I didn't write down, such that from a solution um, psi a, you arrive at a new solution psi tilde a tilde. And not only do you arrive at such a solution, but you also find that under this transformation, the three halves norm of the curl is preserved. Okay, so in that sense, the question I'm asking is conformally invariant. And of course, when you hear, when you're working in this business of sharp functional inequalities, you're reminded of Leap's 83 work where he found the optimal constant, the HLS inequality. And how did he do this? Well, he did this exactly by exploiting its conformal invariance. He was jumping back and forth between the RN version and the SN version and used somehow different techniques, which were only um, consistent with, with each other in some sense, if the solution had a, a, particularly, a particular form, all right? So that kind of gives one hope that these problems with a large symmetry class lead to nice solutions. On the other hand, um, of course, the difficulty is, I mean, symmetries are nice, but really the question is how can we use them analytically? And here in this problem, we actually have a different symmetry, which is the gauge invariance. And that says that if you have a, a solution, a pair of solutions, psi and A of the equation we're considering, and you're given any real function, I mean, this has to be a little bit nice, but not particularly. And then you just multiply psi by e to the i chi. And at the same time as you add the gradient of chi to a, then you get a new solution. And again, since just because the curl of the gradient vanishes, you did not change the three over two norm. Okay, so the upshot is we have a huge symmetry uh, uh, problem, a uh, huge symmetry group in this problem. And we have to, we would like to take advantage of that. All right, so let me tell, I told you at the beginning that it's very easy to get the bound with a one times S3. Let me explain you how this works. This works very similar to how one proceeds in the scalar case. Remember the scalar case, that was just two inequalities. That was Sobolev and Holder. And these are now the ingredients. All right, so once again, the setup is, we have a solution to that equation, a non-trivial one. We assume that this solution, now for this argument, we assume that it belongs in, to L6. All right, now 
simply because of the equation, because this thing here is equal to zero, when I squared and integrate it, I get zero. That gives this left inequality. On the other hand, remember when I told you on the previous slide that we can expand the Pauli operator as the ordinary magnetic Laplacian plus the sigma dot B term. Right, I mean, that's, I mean, either you believe me or you, you just check this computation. That's, that's really a simple thing. Okay, I think this is related to, to some Bochner-Weizenbeck formula in some sense, when you think of, of this A, this one form um, as, as a connection. Anyway, so zero is equal to the difference of these two terms here. And we want to think of this as, I mean, having this term on the larger side. And our goal is to apply Sobolev's inequality. And the observation is that, yes, you can apply Sobolev's inequality by something that in mathematical physics is called the diamagnetic inequality, which just compares the gradient of a vector object, a spinner, to this gradient of a scalar object, namely the absolute value of psi. Okay, and so there's an inequality that this magnetic gradient is pointwise greater than the non-magnetic gradient of the absolute value. So we do that, then we get back into familiar territory where we have just the gradient of psi, absolute psi squared, and now we apply Sobolev to bound this again by the, our S3 and the sixth norm of psi. Very good. So that gave us a lower bound on this term. So what we need is an upper bound on that term, but that we do just as before, and simply by Hölder's inequality, right? So first of all, um, just playing with the sigma matrices, it's not difficult to see that this thing by itself is bounded by psi squared times the length of this curl, when I think of it as a vector field. So by Hölder's inequality, again, I can put this into three halves, which is what I got here. And then the other thing, this guy goes into L6. And so once again, we found a low, a six norm on the left and a six norm on the right with the same power, one third. If the solution is non-trivial, we can cancel it. And we learn that the three norm of the, the curl up here, the three halves, sorry, the three halves norm of the curl up here is bounded by one times S3. That was simple, right? That was just the straightforward adaptation of this uh, scalar problem to this vector problem, where we got rid of all the vector nature of all the quantities by using this uh, diamagnetic inequality up here. Um, a short question, maybe you will talk about this in a bit, but um, so this diamagnetic inequality, that's the one that you would think is not maybe optimal, where there should be another constant? Yes, okay. yes, because that, see that question, um, that sort of kills all the, the vector structure. Uh, I mean, see, the question is somehow we want to understand, or what we don't understand is how the, if you have a, a, a vector field or a spinner field and you sort of, you understand its absolute value, so its length, there is still a lot of freedom in how the, the normalized, so the vector field divided by its length, how that uh, moves around, that, that's a unit vector field. And that's sort of the, the object that we don't understand. And that's somehow the thing that's completely thrown out here. Okay, I see. That, that's the specific, the specific property of, our, of the, these vector spin out value problems. Okay, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you, thank you. Roughly, okay, good. So let me, let me go ahead and let me tell you the two ingredients that we get for, um, for improving this and getting the constant from one times S3 up to two times S3. Um, 
And so as was already suggested, one improvement is to improve this diamagnetic inequality. All right, so the point is when we have a solution of that equation, then we can improve that inequality in a pointwise sense. Instead of constant one, which we had on the previous slide, we get a constant square root of three halves. Okay, that's already better than what we had before. If you just plug this into the previous um, proof, nothing changes and you get the three halves times S3, which is an improvement, but still not the constant two. Um, now, the idea that there can be improved, such improved inequalities, that's a very old one. So the general theme here is you have a vector valid object and you wanna compare the gradient of this vector valid object, right, which has many, many entries. You wanna compare that with the gradient of the absolute value of the uh, vector valid object. As far as I understand, the first um, such inequality goes back to Stein uh, in questions from harmonic analysis, he had, um, so this is this, you know, you extend functions to the upper half space, you get a harmonic function there. Um, but then he had also some um, divergence and curl conditions and he got such an improvement. I mean, not, I mean, the, not exactly a three halves, but I mean, some numbers depending on these operators that are vanishing. And he could use that in order to kind of beat the, um, an L1 condition and prove um, some, I mean, so the maximal inequality needs an L1 condition, right? And because of this, he could apply it not to the function itself, but actually to a power of the function such that effectively it, it seemed like you got an L1 uh, maximal inequality, okay? And similarly, in a more geometric uh, context, uh, Yao, this ST Yao, and then also Shen Simon Yao, they use these ideas always to somehow, instead of looking at the function, looking at a power of the function, getting a smaller constant, which gave them some room to do something. So this is really, um, has been used many times. The one case where we, um, found that, I mean, it's not this particular inequality, but something that's at least in the spinner setting, that's in a paper of Feehan from 2001. And he does not quite prove this. He has some additional smoothness assumption and non-zero assumptions, but that can be overcome. And from a wider perspective, there were a couple of papers by uh, Calderbank, uh, Gouduchon, Herzlich, and by Branson, where they studied, I mean, they noticed that many people had used such improved inequalities and they tried to use, study this systematically from the point of representation theory and Lie theory. Okay, and so it's, uh, these are, are nice uh, papers if you wanna understand this from a more fundamental perspective. Um, on the other hand, you can also, I mean, once you know it, it's not so hard to just prove it directly. Anyway, that's, Ingredient number one. Now, ingredient number two is an identity. And it's again inspired by these works of Stein, Yao, and uh, Shane Simon Yao, where what they do is you don't look at the function itself or the absolute value of the spinner here itself, but rather at a power of it. And so the power that turns out to be optimal for this argument is one half. Okay, and so this is a very simple identity. You take a spinner valid function, psi, take its absolute value, raise it to the power one half. Then you take the gradient and you square this. Forget about the A, this really, this identity really has nothing to do with the A, the A just cancels um, when you work it out. No equation used, nothing. And so what we do here is on the one side, we have a psi, and on the other hand, we have a psi divided by absolute psi. 
right? Which is natural because the whole thing is homogeneous of degree one in Psi. Now, let me, so just close this. Now, there's first this term that I was talking about, but then there's this other term. And the way I've written is exactly such that you see this constant three halves appearing and actually, because of our ingredient one, we will be able to drop the whole second parenthesis. Okay. Now, the identity is not exactly true as we stated, or perhaps it is true, but we didn't prove it like that. Really, instead of the absolute value of psi, you have to add some epsilon squared, but that's really only technical. You put the epsilon in, you do the argument just like if the inequality would be valid, and at the very end of the argument, you let epsilon go to zero. So let's not worry about this. On the other hand, if the functions are nice, and if you don't care about where the functions are equal to zero, then you just get this by, by writing it out. I mean, there's nothing deep, it's an identity. There's nothing really that, that you're using. The one thing that perhaps if you really do want to prove it and apply it later for all H1 functions, the thing that you have to take a bit seriously is the chain rule in Sobolev spaces. And if you use that, then you get around of many of the problems coming from the zero set. Okay, but that's technical and um, I refer to this uh, to our paper. So the upshot of this slide is that if you combine ingredient one with ingredient two, then you get a bound on the square of the gradient of psi to the one half by one half times the real part. And in some sense, this one half is the thing that makes the constant go up by a factor two. Or put differently, the idea is not to play the argument with absolute value psi, but rather with absolute value psi to the one half. And here's how it goes. All right, so we wanna prove the inequality with a factor of two. I remind you from the previous slide, we have an inequality for this gradient squared. All right, so we integrate that identity. On the left side, I got this term here. On the right side, I got that. Now, once again, what we do, I mean, the equation we have involves the sigma matrices. So here we don't have the sigma, so we apply the inequality that relates the Pauli operator to the magnetic Laplacian, which is played differently, right? So that identity here, so I've introduced the sigma fields. And then there is the sigma dot curl A term. Remember, that's the other term that appears in that identity. Now, the first term, the one which has sigma dot the magnetic gradient, that vanishes, right? Just because we are using our equation this thing is just equal to zero. So therefore, we're somehow in the same situation as before, we have a gradient squared bounded from above by a term that involves sigma dot curl A times psi. So now we do exactly the same story as before. We bound this from below by Sobolev's inequality. It's just now we apply Sobolev's inequality to psi to the one half. So therefore what we get is the three norm on the other side, we use Hölder's inequality. We put the curl A into three halves as before. And you see, since this guy, Psi divided by Psi is modulus one, actually also end up with the three norm on the right side. So again, it's very nice. You find the, uh, the three norm of Psi to the power one on both sides of the equation. And now you've gained this additional factor of one half here. And because of that, you get the, the constant two. All right, so that proves the main result. So the idea was, I mean, we're still relying on the Sobolev inequality, on the Hölder inequality, but we've put some additional gradient uh, ingredients in, namely the basic idea is to not work with Psi, but with Psi to the one half. And then using an improved uh, diamagnetic inequality. All right, so let me now talk a little bit about some further developments of that proof, now that you've seen the, the main idea. 
what this is a slide what you can do with it. And then there will be another part of the talk, which is somewhat independent. It's also much shorter than that, where I try to explain a different approach to the problem. But let's go first through these, um, these further modifications, um, what you can do with a proof. So one thing, if you like this, you can work with a weak norm. So you can talk about the weak three halves norm of curl A, right? Then you just replace Sobolev's inequality by its uh, Lorentz space strengthening. Okay, and then you get a similar inequality. Everything goes through in very much the same way. The thing why we think that this is noteworthy is we believe that in that ca case, the constant that we get, so, so to speak, the two, right? The two that we got, I mean, that becomes a little bit different, but you know what I mean. That thing is probably optimal. Though we haven't completely worked out the details um, because the, the example where we believe optimality is achieved is a bit singular. Anyway, a different direction that you can explore is, I was talking about these loss Yao zero mods Psi and A, and they were solving the equation that we've been talking about. But in fact, if you look at the loss Yao paper, what they do is they actually get a different equation where you have your Dirac operator on the left. And on the right, you don't have sigma dot A, but rather you have a scalar function lambda. Okay, so the important thing is this is a scalar function. So now you might play the same game. You might ask yourself, which condition on, of, uh, on lambda, it's the three norm in this case, that's the relevant quantity, which conditions on lambda are necessary for having a non-trivial solution. And actually, this problem is very um, similar to uh, Hijasi's inequality in spin geometry. In some sense, when this function lambda is number one, positive, number two, smooth, then you can use Hijasi's inequality to get exactly that bound. Our proof, however, does not use neither positivity nor smoothness. And what's important there is that you get in this case an optimal bound, namely one that is saturated by the loss Yao modes. Okay, so that's a scalar variant of the argument. Now, the next question you might ask is, is this all uh, restricted to three dimensions? And the question the answer is no, not really. However, we can only do what we did in odd dimensions. That already should also tell you that there is something topological underlying this, which we have not quite understood yet. This is interesting also if, uh, because the, the loss Yao construction was generalized by uh, Dunn and Min to exactly odd uh, dimensions greater or equal than three. The, what to do in the case of even dimensions is an open problem, which I think is, is very interesting. And then, uh, as I was mentioning, this idea of getting a better diamagnetic inequality, that's also useful when you go back now to this physics problem that I mentioned at the beginning. But I don't want to talk about this. And the upshot is whether the constant is really four times S3, as would be the case if the loss Yao pair would be optimal, but this is the case or not, this is an open problem. All right, so that concludes the, the first part of this talk. Let me now approach the problem from a different perspective. See, when you go back to, um, to what we've done, really we've very, very much relied on the Sobolev inequality, the ordinary Sobolev inequality for scalar functions. That was kind of the, the thing that drove everything. And we've just tried to, to apply this in a little bit a uh, smart way. What you might ask yourself is, are there Sobolev type inequalities 
for spinner fields and for vector fields, which somehow would give you the, the result with a constant four. And we don't know, but we have two conjectures, right? I'm writing them as conjecture one and conjecture two. Conjecture one concerns spinner fields and correspondingly a Dirac operator here. Conjecture two concerns vector fields and we have some curls there, okay? Now, the fact that these inequalities hold is not, not new. I mean, or it's, it's, I mean, it's easy to prove. On the other hand, our conjecture is about exactly this value of the sharp constant. Okay, so both inequalities control the three norm of some object by the three halves norm of the object with derivatives. Now, that's pretty straightforward in the spinner case. However, in the, in the vector field case, well, you know, if you have a, a vector, I mean, if you only have a curl A on the, on the larger side of the inequality, of course you can make this equal to zero without making A equal to zero. Therefore, on the left side, you have somehow to compute the norm, you have to remove all gradient fields. So we have the three norm of A minus a gradient field, take the infimum over chi, and, and this thing we claim is bounded by this three halves norm, okay? Which is now consistent with, I mean, if the curl of A is equal to zero, then you have a gradient field. So at least one side is zero and the other side is zero. All right, now, Let's talk a little bit about this, these constants. Why would these constants imply the inequality with 4s3? It's more or less the same story. So where do we start? We start in here. So that's the equation, right? So we, the, uh, the equation that we want to talk about is sigma dot nabla is equal to sigma dot a with an i. You just take the, the three halves norm of that equation and you have this equality. On the left side, see the, the new thing is that we're working now with a three halves norm. Up to now, we always worked with a two norm. As a three halves norm, we could, if we would know conjecture one, we could bound this from below and we would get, uh, I mean, that's simply conjecture one rewritten. On the other hand, now we do with the right side, we do what we always do. We apply Hölder's inequality. So that puts us A into L3, sine L3. And now the three norm, at least if you use the gauge invariance that I was talking about, so you can drop that term. And then you can bound the three norm by the three halves norm of the curl with that constant Again, you find the three norm of psi on the left and on the right, with power one, you cancel that and you get the inequality with four S3. So the idea, I mean, or the, the message is that conjecture one and conjecture two with exactly those constants imply, would imply the bound with constant four instead of constant two, what we have so far. Now, interestingly, both conjectures, both conjectured inequalities are conformally invariant. This is very non-trivial, right? Because when you have these um, P Laplace inequalities, the, the Sobolev inequality with P different from two, that inequality is not conformally invariant. However, because we have this spin or vector field structure, we now arrive at a conformally invariant inequality. Evidence for the conjecture comes from the fact that, of course, you can just formally write down the Euler-Lagrange equation for this inequality. And actually you find that the loss Yao zero modes satisfy both Euler-Lagrange equations uh, coming from these two inequalities. And I guess that's, 
I mean, for, for us, I mean, the, this this is great evidence. But of course, the, the point where we are stuck is just we don't know how to prove these inequalities, just as I said before, because we have hardly any techniques to prove inequalities about vector valued objects. There's one thing we can do, however, and that is at least prove the existence of a minimizer for the inequalities. Now, you might not find that particularly exciting because there are really very, very many theorems about the existence of optimizers. And usually they all follow a pretty straightforward adaptation of some standard arguments. What I try to tell you here is that for this inequality, the vector field inequality, proving existence of an optimizer is actually rather non-trivial. So the precise statement is that if you, it's a little bit more than only existence of a minimizer, it's also relative compactness up to symmetries of minimizing sequences. Okay, so if you have any minimizing sequence, there's a subsequence which you can act on with the symmetries to get something that converges in the strong norm of the problem. Um, and so the point is why the usual Lyon's concentration compactness approach does not work, or at least we could not make it work, is because this constraint, this norm here, right, where you take this infimum of a chi is so very non-local. So in other words, if you have a bunch, a bump A going to one side and another bump of A going to the right side, you would like to say that, I mean, the three norms to the power three would essentially be additive, right? Because it's just, I'm integrating here and I'm integrating over there. And it's the three norm to the power three. And that's just the, the integral on the left plus the integral on the right. Now here, however, when you do this thing, when you subtract this gradient field, you might lose, I mean, you certainly lose the locality and we are not able to quantify by how much, I mean, that we have at least asymptotically when these things are very far away, that at least we have asymptotic uh, locality. So instead we use a different argument that was appears, I mean, it's hardly used in the literature. There's a paper by Garcia Peral 1989, where they suggested such an argument for P Laplace equations. Now for those, you can usually use that and therefore perhaps people have not really looked at it. And so the idea, let me outline the proof. Mm. So the suggestion of Garcia Peral concerns number three and number four. So the first step is you try to find uh, so you have a minimizing sequence and you try to find a weak limit. Well, that you always have. The idea is you find a weak limit, which is non-zero. Okay. They have to work. And the way we do this is by using some refined Sobolev inequalities in Bessel spaces. Okay. Now we have this non-trivial weak limit, but that guy could, there could be, this could only carry a little bit of the mass. Okay, so we need to show that the sky, this non-trivial weak limit actually has all the mass. And so the suggestion of Garcia Peral is that first of all, by Eklund's variational principle, we can assume that these elements of the minimizing sequence satisfy an approximate Euler-Lagrange equation. It's almost like you, they all solution to the Euler-Lagrange equation, except that there's a right side, which however is very small. And now the idea is you wanna pass to the limit in the equation. And then when you can show that the weak limit satisfies the equation, then everything is fine. You know that you have a, an optimizer, okay? But the, of course, the problem is that the equation is nonlinear. You only have weak convergence and that creates problems. All right, now here's, that's the last slide I'm about to end. This is a very technical result that appears there, but this is really the core of this existence argument. It's related to the Rayleigh-Kondratov theorem, okay? So what does Rayleigh-Kondratov theorem say? Well, it says that if you have, just for scalar functions first, it says that if the gradients converge weakly, then the functions converge strongly as long as you stay away from the critical exponent, right? Now, how about the same statement for vector fields? Now, obviously, when both the curls 
converge weakly and the divergences converge weakly, then you have the same thing. Just because even in LP spaces, both curls and divergences together are comparable to the full gradient. The idea here is, this is what makes the proposition difficult, that when we are in our problem, right? So, you know, you want to optimize over chi, right? That you we want to subtract the optimal uh, gradient field. Then A satisfies an equation, but that's a quasi-linear equation. Okay, so that's the divergence of absolute A n times A n, which is equal to zero. That just means that we have optimized over chi, over the gauge. So we have weak convergence of the curl, but for the divergence, we have something nonlinear. So it's actually equal to zero, but some nonlinear expression is equal to zero. And then the statement is just like ordinary Rayleigh Kondrachev. Then we have strong convergence as long as we stay away from the critical exponent. Okay. So the, the difficulty is here, we have to deal with that, with that constraint. Now for technical reasons, so we actually prove the same result, but on the, on the sphere. So we talk about one forms on the sphere, everything else is the same, right? I mean, we have Ds instead of curls and D stars instead of divergences, but otherwise um, it's the same thing. All right. And now what, what goes in there? See. The point is, I mean, that has been emphasized by work of, of Ulm back and, and many people uh, many years ago, that the good gauge would be somehow if we could gauge A to have divergence equal to zero, right? Because then we have control on curl and cur uh, uh, control on the divergence. So the question is, so we have two, there's the same A or the same uh, one from alpha and but once we have it with this thing, and then once we have it within the Coulomb gauge. And what we need here is such a theorem. Let me read that for you and then I'm done. So you might recognize, so we have an equation here. Let's look at this equation. Okay, that's the, gen, the generalization of that equation. Okay. Really, we have two equations, two such equations, coming from two different choices of xi. Right? There's a xi one here, and there's a xi two in the other equation. So that gives us two solutions, phi one and phi two. And the conclusion that we want to get is that if the xi's are close together, then the d phi's are close together. And what's hard about this, see, that's the uh, p Laplacian in R3 or something, where p is equal to three. That's exactly the, the, the borderline case. It's a critical case. And what we need here, because right for the rayleigh kondrachev we need to um, be below the critical exponent. So we need here such a bound, such a stability bound for an exponent three minus something. Okay. And I mean, that bound is actually not quite true as we want it, but there's an additional term, which has an epsilon squared. So that creates a lot of headache. Anyway, lemmas of that type were proved by Ivanic. These are quite deep results. We could use, I mean, this lemma exactly does not appear in his work, but somehow using techniques that he has introduced, we're able to prove such a lemma and then simultaneously letting epsilon go to zero and the sequence index go to infinity, we're eventually able to prove such a nonlinear Rayleigh Kondrachev lemma. So that was a little bit quick at the end. I hope I gave you a little bit of a flavor. And most importantly, I hope I, I convinced you that this is a very interesting problem. Anyway, thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you very much.